at my signal, unleash hell. Okay, here's your 30 minutes. You got it. Doing shorts. It's all me. It's all on me. Talk about the current gender war. I've written about this topic before. I have talked about this topic before. Here we are. Dangerous times. No applause. No applause. No applause for the 30 minute shows. <laughs> We're just going to jump right in today. Uh, I'm sure some of you have already uh, watched Rich Cooper's um, broadcast about um, what's been going on with the college, I guess, in Australia. And um, I guess one of the rituals was sort of this ritual humiliation, which is the best term I can uh I can apply to this, but it's the ritual humiliation of uh, young men, uh, young boys, uh, apologizing um, for the sins of their fathers, paying for the sins of their fathers. Right? Uh, we lived in a patriarchy before, so therefore we want we want restitution. And I've said this before. Uh, I, I'm going to read through a few of these articles because I think that this is just this incident, by the way, that happened in Australia. That I think a uh, uh, a few other. Um, manosphere notables have been talking about i think this is just the tip of the iceberg that's why uh, i think it deserves a little bit more uh, exploration and that's what i'm going to do today uh, i'll i'll be uh, kind of sifting through a few uh today's going to be a little data heavy sorry um, i'm going to be sifting through some of these stories that i think are relevant to this one that is in um in, in australia and i think maybe i'll just start with it right now um but just to give you a little uh just a preface to all of this um i've written um several essays about exactly this uh, i think probably the one that comes to mind the most and i'm going to make sure that it's in the description for this one is um uh, gender war and i i wrote a, a post i believe it was in i think it was in the beginning of 2020 um like maybe january of 2020 i could be wrong but i it was actually titled gender war and i wrote it um because i was sort of making predictions about what we could expect during the uh the election cycle here in the united states uh as well as what we could expect uh to see sort of in gender politics from them um so a lot of the stuff that I talked about sort you know came true. I'm I'm not any you know I'm not a I'm not Roladamus. Thank you. I'm flattered that you think so, but uh, I just can see patterns and things like that. I'm still convinced that uh, Kamala Harris will eventually be the president of the United States. I think that was really sort of the the goal from the outset. Um, I think there's a lot of other things that are at play as well. But uh, all politics, all social. Um, conversation all social debate um social theory is gender theory now and we can see that it's not just here in the u.s um we're looking today we're going to be looking at uh, australia uh we're also looking at the uk um pretty much any western nation pretty much any nation really right now that is having uh western style gynocentrism uh exported to it or is uh, sort of spontaneously producing it themselves. Uh, I don't think a lot of people really realize the, uh, the expansiveness of gynocentrism right now. They think that it's only an American thing, or they think that it's only uh, a, a Western society thing. And uh, I, have pr I think I have proved my point in spades in my fourth book, which you can see right there is uh, uh, Rational Male Religion. Uh, a bit of that, I talk about how um, Western gynocentrism is uh, exported, is passed along, and is eventually assimilating not just religions, but also uh, cultural narratives and uh, all politics, all society, all social power will be gender specific in the future. And uh, that's one of the, I guess, prognostications that I make in that book. So here we are. Uh, now, now we're looking at things, uh, now granted, this is March. I'm, I'm doing this on March. What is today? Today's the 31st, right? March 31st, uh, 2021. And here we are. 
And usually in March is Women's History Month, so everybody makes a big deal about women's issues, and that's when everybody is supposed to pay attention. March 8th is International Women's Day, and that's the day that we go, yay, girl power, right? That's the all around the world. Not just, uh, not just in the U.S., not just in Western nations, but that's when everybody starts to stand up and pay attention to things. And so I don't find it shocking in the least bit uh, to see something like uh, this happening in the month of March, even in Australia, where you've got young boys who are forced to turn to the girl next to them and apologize for the sins of their fathers, for the sins of their past, for the sins of patriarchy, for the sins of uh, whatever it is that in any way uh, kept the woman down. And I think there's a lot more to it than just this, but we're dealing with a, uh, well, certainly a generation, actually two or three generations now that are rooted in emotionalism. And so part of that emotionalism is demanding a, 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 a response, demanding a, an apology. It'll make us feel better. We're the, the, the little girls who are standing next to the little boys don't really realize why they're being apologized to, but uh, they're happy to have it because it makes them feel good and gives them confidence and a sense of security, perhaps. Um, but I think that it's, it's, um, it's wrong, first of all. Um, these boys have not, their, their ledger is clear as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, now I'm not making some holy decree, but I'm just saying that this, this, this kind of stuff where you're um, forcing in, um, let's see, mandating, uh, apologies and mandating an acceptance of guilt. That's, I mean, that's like, you know, cultural revolution of China kind of stuff that stand up and admit that you were wrong and there's no way to be right. So it's not about race anymore. It's not about culture. It's not about that. It's about men versus women. And that's why I keep, t I, I, I titled that essay gender war back when I was writing about it. And that's why I'm still looking at this stuff. I, I actually, prior to gender war, I wrote a three part series on the rational uh, It was called dangerous times. And this was back in like 2018, I believe. And I was sort of looking into my, you know, crystal balls, looking at my, where is it? <laughs> Looking into my into my magic eight ball uh, to see what the uh, to see what the uh, the future would hold for um, young men, and I have to say that this is probably one of those things. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to share this with you just really quick. I'm not going to get into any video, uh, and I, I'm going to try to keep this as brief and succinct as possible. So um, let's go and have a look here at uh, what's the first one, which is Bauer. There we go. All right, so here you have it. Um, let me, oh, okay, I'll just leave it there. That's, that sounds good. Okay, so this is the thing, uh, Bauer College, uh, <laughs> Warnambool, I guess. Uh, this is from uh, Australian News. Uh, male students forced to apologize to female students for sexism. So admitting that they are innately, inherently sexist. So that you, you don't get a pass. You don't get, there's, there is nothing that you can do. You were born with a penis and therefore you are sexist automatically. And this is a hell of a thing to teach young men, young boys at such an early age. Furious parents have hit it, have hit out at a school where they say their sons were forced to stand up at an assembly and apologize on behalf of their gender. So where, where does this seem like a good idea? Like, and, and who is this going to make feel better? I've said this a million times on my show, on uh on rule zero i've i've written about this is that feminism is a hate movement feminism is ne has never been about equality it has never been about equity it has only been about restitution and retribution and that is since 1849 1848 1849 in seneca falls way back in the days of the suffragettes a lot of people want to say, well, you know, there's different waves of feminism, Rolo. Uh, there's the first wave and the second wave and the third wave. And they want to make this wave the good wave and that wave the bad wave. And quite honestly, there are no waves of feminism. They have always been the same thing. They have always had the same purpose. It is female supremacism. That's where we're going with this. It's retribution and restitution is what this is. You say, well, but women got the right to vote. Okay, yeah, we can keep focusing on that, but you have to also understand that during the time of the suffragettes, voting and people's attitudes towards voting, especially in the United States, were not what they are today. Voting was seen as something that was something that a, a civic duty. 
It was something that's seen as like not so much a privilege or anything. It's uh, I'm sure it was, but it was seen as a civic duty. So having having a say, having a stake in the uh, the direction of the country. Okay, well, yeah, great, fine. I got it, suffragettes, you got it. But the thing is, is that you don't understand, nobody really does any of their homework when it comes to classic historical feminism. These are the feminists that in the UK also, uh, in the United States also, were bombing churches, were, bombing, were planning assass assassination attempts. Um, we're talking about like literally acts of terrorism of the suffragettes from back in the day. Now, I'm not going to get too, too involved in that right now because uh, I want to sort of you know, explore where we're going with this, but I wanted to give you another preface here is that I'm not of the opinion that there have ever been any waves of feminism. Now, we can say, well, there's social this and social this. No, the, the impetus, the ideology of feminism has not changed since it was conceived or since it was, became a sort of sociopolitical movement since the mid-1800s. Now, it's been interrupted by war. It's been interrupted by social unrest. It has been interrupted by, um, you know, communism and socialism. It has been interrupted by uh, certain things along the way until it got to the point where uh, we had hormonal birth control and we had the sexual revolution. And that's when feminism really came into its own. So we can't just celebrate feminism up through the first wave and then say, oh, second and third wave were, were militant feminism. And it's, it's really bad. I, 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 one of the difficulties I have with a guy like Gad Saad, and I love his stuff, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a fanboy of Gad. But one thing he makes clear or tries to at least make a distinction for in his latest book, which is The Parasitic Mind, as he tries to uh, preface feminism with sort of militant feminism or progressive feminism or, you know, kind of quality. It's almost like toxic masculinity. No, there's just feminism. And that's where this comes from. This idea that young boys need to be conditioned. You want to talk about blue pill conditioning? This is classical conditioning. This is Pavlovian conditioning of this generation. I don't even know what this generation is going to be called. It's not Generation Z right now because we're talking about kids, young men. All right, so so bear that in mind. I'll continue here. It says, uh, parents of the male students in or at a school in Victoria's Southwest are furious with their son, uh, that their sons are, excuse me, after their sons were forced to stand up at an assembly and apologize to their female classmates. Brower College in Warren, I'm going to murder this, uh, Warren Ambul uh, held a, an assembly on Wednesday where boys were told to stand in solidarity for female students who had experienced sexual harassment. Okay, well, we have to define what sexual harassment is. We can make it as ambiguous as we want, whatever it is. But the presumption is that all boys are going to be sexual harassers. I see what the, I see what the impetus is behind this teach them not to harass. And by doing so, we admit that we are all, we, because we were born with male parts, that we are innately, inherently going to harass. And therefore, we need to be aware of that before we go off into life and try to succeed in this great big world. Outraged parents say their sons were told to apologize to the girls for offensive behaviors on behalf of their gender. Gender now, gender before, gender in the future. The move comes after a viral petition exposed thousands of stories of sexual assault from students and former students around Australia, throwing the education sector into crisis. Why is this now? A Snapchat post believed to be by a male student at the school took aim at the assembly saying, today at Brower, they made every guy stand up and apologize to every girl for rape, sexual assault, and so on. Guys are always the bad guys in everything these days. I'm not saying girls do not go through shit. Guys go through as much shit as girls do. And guess who takes the brunt of this? Now you can see that here in the thing. I'm not going to read this whole thing because I've got a lot of other ones to get to here too. Parent Danielle Shepard said her 12-year-old son who is in year seven, I guess at seventh grade at the school was uh, left feeling confused following the exercise. So these are technically middle school, I guess they would be middle school uh, boys. Wow, just wow. This is actually disgusting Brower College. Not, all uh, not at all impressed with uh, that you made my son apologize for something he's never done nor considered doing. 
She wrote on social media. Other parents applauded the school's actions on social media, saying they supported the school leaders for bringing the issue to light. That is not bringing the issue to light. This is classical operant conditioning. That's what this is. I'm glad these issues are being discussed at the school and all schools should do the same, one parent said. Another parent wrote, there's always more than one side to a story. This is just one student's take on what happened. Um, forgive me if I disagree with that. So here we have young men being forced to, onto their knees to apologize, maybe not onto their knees, but like f essentially forcing to admit guilt without trial, without habeas corpus. I made this, uh, I made this point actually back in, uh, back when, um, when the Me Too movement was coming around. And remember the believe all women narrative? You're going to see that very soon. I think if not, if not here in the US, you're probably going to see this uh, maybe in Australia, maybe in the UK, because I'm going to read some UK stories here in just a moment. Um, that was actually story number one. Uh, when the Me Too uh, movement kind of picked up to where, where it really kind of, I think really the Me Too movement sort of came to its apex with the Brett Kavanaugh um, uh, trials, let's say, witch trials, essentially, uh, for him to become a Supreme Court justice in the United States. Uh, and I think what was interesting is that um, the Me Too movement, which was like, believe all women, uh, one of the things that I don't think a lot of people really grasped was that it was denying basic human rights. I mean, as far as we can define human rights, which is habeas, you know, right to right to a face of your accuser, right? A, uh, a, a habeas corpus, right? You know, bring the body. That's essentially what it is. It's 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 basic fundamental stuff. Like, okay, well, these are the accusations, and this is the case that in this case where you've got young men who probably like young men, uh, young boys. Let's just say, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade. You've got these guys who, in all likelihood, because they are sort of global citizens right now, a part of that global citizenry is accepting that men are innately, inherently dangerous. Uh, about two weeks ago, I did a, I did a quick, oh no, actually, I think it was on, on Rule Zero. I was talking to Troy, who, uh, Troy Francis, who is in the UK, and we were discussing the, um, the proposal, didn't happen, but the proposal that there should be some sort of 6 p.m. curfew for men so that women could sort of gallivant around the streets of London and not, and feel, you know, free after, uh, you know, some girl had been, had been brutally assaulted and, okay, and killed, understood. Yeah, not, not not taking anything away from that, but the fact that we would actually say that, you know, or there would actually be a proposal for something as silly as doing some sort of lockdown for just men after, a, you know, a curfew for men at 6 p.m. Um, it makes women feel better because we're living in an age of emotion. But my focus is always on what is motivating this, what motivated the teachers to presume that these young men needed to acknowledge that they were guilty and that the their predecessors were guilty, that their friends were guilty. And I'm going to get into that here in just a second here, because this is a really good one. Um, this was interesting to me. I'm going to actually, let me, let me back up just a bit here. Um, and by the way, Daily Mail, I really hate your website. Um, I hate having to go to this website because it is just a mess. But uh, let's see, where is that? Is this it? No. Oh, there it is. I think that's it. Is that us? There we go. Okay, so Daily Mail, um, you have nothing but, but clickbait everywhere on your thing. So this is from the Daily Mail, and this is uh, from this week as well. And I think that this is pertinent because remember, this is like, uh, let's see, the last update for this was the 29th. Shop your own sons. Police chief urges parents who suspect their child in school sex scandal to contact officers as Sir Keir Starmer calls, I hope that I'm saying that right, calls for inquiry and cultural change in attitudes towards girls and women. Parents urged to report their sons if they think they have committed sexual abuse. NPCC Chief Simon Bailey speculated school sex scandal is fueled by porn. More than 100 schools named in more than 6,600 uh, 6, harrowing testimonies. Are you going to go and filter through all those 6,600 harrowing testimonies? 
everyone's invited website set up by former private school pupil Soma Sarah. And I will explain what this is. Actually, Soma is actually Soma Sarah is actually older than 22, but uh, 22 Whitehall inquiry has been uh, in, uh, launched into the growing scandal in school. So now it's parents sell out your kids. A police chief has today urged parents to hand in their own children to the police if they suspect them of sexual abuse. As Labor's Sir Keir Starmer urged for cultural change in attitudes towards girls and women. Odd that this should come up in March. Simon Bailey, who's lead, who, who leads the National Police Chiefs Council, NPCC, on child protection, said that parents who become aware of their son's has a oh has that they've committed a sexual assault should contact the police it comes as he revealed officers have received more than 7000 testimonies from pupils at schools alleging sexual abuse uh and there's your guy there's simon bailey right all right um let's see so I'll, I will throw these, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I've got other ones to get to today and I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on these ones right here, but you, I'll put the, uh, I'll put the, the, the links in the description below so you guys can rip through them if you want. Uh, again, my, um, my point in this is now we have, now it's like parents rat out your kids, rat out your boys. You're not ratting out your girls. You're only ratting out your boys because only boys can possibly be abusers. Only boys can possibly harass or be imp impolite or in, in inappropriate whatever it is that you whatever we're going to call sexual assault whatever we're going to call harassment whatever 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 made a made susie feel bad we're going to say this is this is harassment in some way and so now you are presumed guilty unless you can prove yourself innocent believe all women trust me this is coming back we will see this come back it will be reheated very soon so we've got that. Uh, that's not. That's that was a good one. Uh, let's move on. I've got some more here. Um, granted, this is from a, uh, uh, I guess, a scandal of some sorts. I wasn't even aware of this until I was. I actually have uh, a few people who are hitting me up in my DMs on my my Twitter who are making me aware of this. Uh, let's see. Um, how about this one? Moving right along. Um, let's see, Soma Sarah, let's see, here she is. This is our Soma Sarah story. Uh, Everyone's Invited founder Soma Sarah says rape culture movement is not about naming or shaming. Well, the problem with that is, is now we have police and we have the authorities encouraging parents not just to name and shame, but to actually turn their kids in if they suspect that Johnny has some sort of nefarious past <laughs> is is groping okay um let's see uh name of shame schools and problem is entrenched in society so now we're going into a larger bigger narrative as website nears ten thousand claims soma sarah rallied against excuse me railed against an endemic rape culture that permeates every school so now it's not just the one that we were talking about before, and I realize this is not Australia, this is in the UK. Uh, almost 10,000 people have anonymously posted experiences on the website, anonymously. Ministers are under pressure to launch an inquiry into the deepening scandal. Across where? Across all of these places? <laughs> Meanwhile, in Nottingham, that <laughs> bans booze and all that. <laughs> Um, the founder of a website flooded with pupils' allegations of sexual harassment has uh, said the scandal should not focus on naming and shaming specific schools. What else are you going to do? How do you open an inquiry into all of this? So Masera instead railed against the endemic rape culture. Now we can make it a little bit more generalized. That permeates every school, every university, at home and in society. So now it's not just about schools, it's about everywhere. You can't walk outside without having it smack you in the face. Almost 10,000 people have anonymously posted experiences of misogyny, abuse on the, on the everyone's invited, everyone's invited website, sparking a reckoning that has been likened to the Me Too movement. Surprise. I'm shocked. Shocked, I say. Shocked that this comes after the UK has decided that they are going to make misogyny. Poof misogyny 
a hate crime. So now all of a sudden we can, everybody is guilty. Everyone is a suspect. Everyone is a criminal. And that's really what, that's really where all of this is going. Again, I will make that link available to you later on. That's our good Soma Sarah, who I have no idea who she is. So now um, let's see. I could go on with this. I've got another one here. It says rape culture scandal deepens as X Ben and end in pupil 24 sends new dossier with dozens of sexual abuse claims to heads of top public schools and universities in Exeter and Bristol are dragged into the row. Zan Moon, 24, was inundated with women sharing harrowing experiences. Her 15-page document describes in grim detail allegations made against pupils. Eaton, I hope I'm saying that, Eaton, Eton, um, Tonbridge, and Charterhouse said they take the allegations very seriously. So more mounting rape culture and scandal throughout all of, uh, actually, private school, and now apparently it's all over the place. Um, a former private school pupil has compiled a dossier exposing fresh claims of fresh claims of rape culture and sent it to the heads of some of Britain's most prestigious schools as the universities of Exeter, Bristol were dragged into the row. Zan Moon, 24, was inundated with women sharing harrowing experiences of harassment and misogyny. There's that word again after appealing for testimonies last week. <laughs> appealing for testimonies. Oh, you go looking for it. You're probably going to find it. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, so there's, there's a few more of these, uh, there, I've got another one here it says now primary pupil. Actually, let me throw this one up here. This is, this is a good one. Let's keep going here. I, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, you know, you, you just make all of these baseless claims roll up. Well, here you go. It's not baseless. Now primary pupil tells of sexual assault primary. Okay. We're talking about kids and we're not talking middle school. Now we're talking younger. Uh, primary school's pupils have reported harassment on website everyone's invited. So everybody's piling on. Ev like, hey, Janie, what do you think? Oh, I was, I was touched. Jimmy pulled my pigtails. Primary school pupils have reported harassment on website everyone's invited. Site has thousands of claims, including reports involving pupils as young as five Head teachers have urged anonymous victims to come forward so they can act. Secondary head teachers union said schools alone should not bear the burden. <laughs> Primary schools are the latest to become embroiled in the rape culture storm after former pupils posted claims of sexual assaults. The website on which thousands of older children have reported harassment and abuse now has allegations involving pupils as young as five. The 11,000 plus claims on everyone's invited included one alleged assault by a child at the 22,000 pound a year Fulham Preparatory School in West London. Now, again, it, you, I will, I'll, I'll let you guys read through this if you want to. Um, again, my, my focus here isn't to to just fo just to look at whatever the scandal, that thing that's going on. But we've got this thing that's going on in Australia right now. And I'm not, I'm thinking this is not necessarily a coincidence. <laughs> um, we're presuming that to be a man is to be a criminal, is to be a potential rapist. That's really where all of this goes. Now, last but not least, I've got to put this one up here too, because almost unironically or ironically, however you want to, Call it. Here we go. A study in seediness. It's a disturbing contrast. Just as schools are tackling a toxic sexual culture, woke universities are supporting sex work for their students. And who gets to do the majority of the sex work? Let's be honest. And even accusing those who object of discrimination. So it's okay if a young lady decides that she wants to get into OnlyFans but accusing her of, uh, if you're objective of those things or discrimination, they, then they're going to object of discrimination. Then you're going to have a problem with that. Many institutions in the UK stand accused of legitimizing student sex work. <laughs> Poll last year claimed 4% of students using sex work found uh, to fund courses. Amongst these sex workers, 28% said they slept with someone or escorted. 
By day, Anna is an 18-year-old, 18-year-old law student studying diligently in the musty library, musty libraries, of course, <laughs> libraries. Nobody uses the internet and ancient halls of one of Britain's most venerated universities. By night, her life is very different. Anna is a prostitute and has slept with more than 200 men for as little as 10 pounds a time. Most, she has said, are fascinated with how you live your life as a student. So, okay, I'm, I'm not going to say it. Though she, though she ranks her generation's academic elite, uh, as one of her generation's academic elites, Anna is part of a growing band of university students turning to sex work to fund their education. Oh, if we could only have free education, if we could only have free college, then these poor women would not be f forced into prostitution to, to make ends meet. Yet today, many institutions are charging upwards of 9,250 pounds a year in tuition fees. There you have it. So if we just had things a little bit cheaper, if we could make a, you know college more affordable, then things would be a little bit different. So there you have it. Those are my those are my stories for today. Those are the ones that we're sort of exploring here now. For the last 15 minutes or so of this, I want to just reiterate here that going forward, this is what you're going to see. And going forward, you as a man are going to be suspect. It, uh, I, I, I remember during the Me Too, uh, Me Too era, I didn't really want to call it an era because it has really been going on since um, I mean, maybe 2012. I remember seeing posters um, on college campuses um, trying to outline or define what is and what isn't consent. And one of the posters was a, uh, a young man and a young woman. And if the young woman gets drunk or, or if they both get drunk, that was if they both get drunk and Jimmy takes advantage of Susie, then he's going to jail. But we don't look at because Susie can't give consent. Well, neither can Jimmy. And we don't ever put it in those terms. We don't ever think about um we don't ever think about it going back the other way. And the reason why we don't do that is because there is no presumption of equity. There is always a presumption of guilt on the part of men. Men are the ones who are always the aggressors. This goes back to what is known as the Duluth model of feminism. The Duluth model of feminism was something that was uh, a bit of an invent invention, but it was uh, codified, let's just say, in the mid-1980s. And it is what a lot of political and a lot of social doctrine work with right now so if you if, if a police officers go to a home for domestic dispute it is almost universally the man who is going to jail or the man who is going to be leaving that property because there's a presumption that the man is going to be the aggressor and in some cases that might there might be you know men tend to default to anger i get that but because that is the default setting we tend to ignore things that are going on in that in that in that circumstance, let's just say. So the presumption is the presumption of guilt is always on the man. Uh, what is I, I don't know what the stats are now. I'm just going to go by old stats of what I can remember, but I believe that it is 87 or 88% of custody uh, in when it comes to child support, well, come to child custody in a divorce, 88, 86, 88%, I believe uh, goes to women, goes to the mother. Uh, this is what I've I've called the cult of the child and I'm probably end up doing a, a full video about the cult of the child at some point. Um, again, my, um, my point here is not to outrage you, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that if you have a penis, if you, then you are male, right? Then you, then suddenly it's not uh, gender is not a social construct. If you're a man, gender is not a social construct when it comes to uh, your potential for harassment, and I, again, I've said this on many an occasion that we have reached a point, I think, in Western society when it comes to gender relations or intersexual dynamics, whatever you want to call it, where, where women have more or less secured the beta bucks side of hypergamy. And I don't, I don't think I'm saying anything new to people who, who haven't, you know, watched me before or haven't read anything I've talked about, but, uh, we have got to the point where provisioning protection and uh, parental investment 
either socially or politically or monetarily or legislatively is more or less insured, at least in wealthy, affluent Western societies for women. And if and if it isn't completely 100 percent assured, the perception that it is or it could be is prevalent is endemic to that society so women believe that well i've got a i've got a college degree i make my own damn money we see it every time every time i watch fresh and fit i see the same arguments i see the same uh language i I hear the same language from women uh you know as young as 19 to as old as 37 it's always this the language of fempowerment female empowerment I have, I make my own damn money. I have my own damn business. I, I want an equal partner, blah, 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 blah. Okay. They, it goes into their, you know, their sexual strategies, their mating strategies, got that. But from a social perspective, that beta buck side, that long-term security side is sold to women that it is, if it's not assured that it will be assured or it could be assured. So what's left? Well, and we, uh, every black pill guy, every MGTOW, every guy in the manosphere will tell you women are only focusing on the alpha seed side of things. They're only looking on the short term sexual. They're looking for the hot guy in the foam cannon party, right? They're looking for the guy who is going to rock their world in bed. And as I've said before, when women are trying to balance hypergamy, which is alpha seed and beta need, and I'm not using swearing, swearing words today, um, when they're looking for short term sexual versus long term security, the only thing that they haven't been able to 100% assure is access to the t- to the top well 20% I'm, and I'm being generous top 20% of guys that they do want to have sex with so in the absence of being able to control for having sex with the apex alphas they have to find some way to at the very least limit the access of the 80%, the lower half of betas. How do we do that? Well, we start at a very early age. We've been doing this with gender identity for a very long time right now. Um, very, I shouldn't even say that, not even a very long time, because I remember, um, I remember I wrote, a, um, I wrote an essay and it was uh, called Transitioning, that's what it was. And I remember I, I had to write it because there was this push to convince society at large that a three and a half to four year old child could had the had the capacity for abstract thinking enough to decide whether it was born incorrectly in the incorrect sex, right? The incorrect gender. Johnny's not actually a boy, he's actually a girl. Let's let's raise him as a girl. And we're gonna do that because the three year old, sometimes as young as three, knows knows better knows that knows exactly it has enough experience on planet earth in three years to know whether it was born the wrong the wrong gender the wrong sex and you'll hear them characterize it as such and so i wrote i wrote an essay i did some research on it i have not put it in any book so it is on the rational mail if you want to read it but it's called transitioning and um so it's been around but i think what's what's interesting to me right now is that we've normalized it in a very short period of time like four to five years and we have these conversations. And I think that on a social level, that's part of a new form of conditioning. I don't want to call it blue pill conditioning, but, but apparently it is, right? It's this its this idea of it's trying to make a normalization of the fact that this is how the, this social constructionism, this blank slate equalism is is so, so important to a certain mindset to an emotionalist mindset that we have to find some way to normalize it. And we've got to do it now because if we don't, then future generations are going to question it. And the ideology is going to crumble part of that conditioning. And I'm not comparing that to, to the, you know, the gender dysphoria stuff, but part of that conditioning is telling a seventh grade boy, apologize to Susie for your ancestors for father abraham right for 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 the patriarchal societies that have repressed women for so long um in and i if you've read my my fourth book um religion right there uh, i make a case uh also and back in 2018 the august issue of l magazine elle has oprah winfrey on the cover of it and the cover kind of byline underneath oprah's smiling face is 
uh, men and boys need to realize that men and uh, that, that women are their equals. And in some cases their superiors. And I thought that was interesting because that's when I see stuff like that on the cover of a magazine, or I see that coming from somebody as famous as celebrity as Oprah Winfrey, that's when you see a narrative switch or a narrative pivot. And I think that right now we're starting to see this narrative pivot. It's the idea that we have to condition the next generation of men, of young men, to accept their guilt, to accept the fact that they owe a debt of some sorts. That's the restitution part of feminism. As I said before, feminism is about restitution and retribution. It has never been about equality, and it never will be about equality. And put into, backed into a rational, reasonable, logical corner, women have, even the most staunch feminist has no basis for making feminism about equality. It's certainly not now, certainly not in 2021. So when you see this happening, you're going to see more incidences of this, I think. When you see uh, moral panics, moral crises, that's what the Me Too movement was. I don't think a lot of people really realize this. Me Too as a hashtag on Twitter has been around since 2006. Nobody even cared about it. Nobody even brought it up or thought about it until right around 2017. Now, why is that? Is it because we have more access? We have more people online? We have more people thinking about this kind of stuff? No, because Me Too was a social weapon. It was weaponized. It came up and it sounds, and God forbid you be against it, right? God forbid, because the minute you say, it's very polarizing. It's very binary. The minute, you, uh, the minute I put this out there, I sound like I am a misogynist. But yet there's nothing more misandrist than getting a generation of young men to admit some guilt to something that they've never had anything to do, or maybe you've never even thought about it. You don't know. And so what, what's, what's happening, I think, and I'm not saying that assault doesn't happen. I'm not saying that, it, that, uh, that harassment doesn't happen. I'm sure that it does. I especially think that it does for this generation that's been acculturated and socialized online right now. And the, a lot of guys, when we, when we talk, you know, I mean, I, I say this metaphorically, but like when guys are, are autists or they have Asper, they're Spurgs, right? It's not, I'm, I'm not saying that they literally have that. I'm just saying that there is a lack of social intelligence that comes from a lack of acculturation and a lack of a, a socialization and not understanding those things. And as such, it's setting setting those boys up for failure. So even if they're trying to, even if they're socially awkward and they're trying to figure things out in a gynocentric social order that says, Johnny, stay in your lane. You're a beta male. If you try to make an approach on Susie, then that's, then that's misogyny. And in the UK, you're going to go to jail for that. That's a hate crime. So don't talk. It, it, it becomes an issue of Sadie Hawkins world where I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, uh, the Sadie Hawkins dances, but it's, it used to be a novelty uh, where you'd be in junior high school or high school or whatever. And the girls were supposed to ask, ask the, ask the boys out to go to the dance. And of course what happens is all the girls gravitate towards, you know, the most alpha of all the boys to ask them to the dance. And it's supposed to be some sort of, you know, Hey, we're going to have gender equality kind of thing. Ha ha Sadie Hawkins, right? Now we live in Sadie Hawkins world. Or we're, we're, we're advancing towards Sadie Hawkins' world, let's just say. And when we look at the socio-political power of women in Western societies today, this is what you get. This is the level of insecurity that you get. We need to teach these boys. Okay, well, it's not about teaching them to not be harassers or, or abusers or whatever. It's not about teaching them that when you presume the guilt. It is a presumed guilt. It is about the restitution. It is about the retribution, not for the, for not for those kids, not for that generation, but for every generation that came before them. And that's what it really comes down to. It comes down to female supremacism is what it is. And there's a lot of power in the fear that is generated when it comes to insecurities and it comes to the things that women want to assure themselves of for the rest of their lives. So, 
Uh, that said, I'm going to leave it right there and let you guys opine about anything that I've talked about today. Um, again, I'm sure this is going to get a little feisty, so be uh, try to try to play nice in the comments. Um, and so that's my 30, 30 minute, or actually my 45 minutes today. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I will be back on uh, Rule Zero on Saturday, this coming Saturday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, and it will be on Ryan Stone's channel. See you guys. Bye.